Well, I'm here in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Actually, I'm here at Hyde Park Country Club with Pat O'Brien, who's the uh, ground superintendent here for this course. And I thought we would learn a little bit about zoysia, specifically zoysia japonica, which is unique to this course. So, um, first, Pat, you want to tell us something about yourself and who you are and where you're from? Uh, yeah, I'd love to. Um... I'm the ground superintendent at Hyde Park Country Club. Um, I'm originally from London, Ontario, Canada, so zoysia grass is um, pretty unique. We, had, we didn't see much of it up, up north. Um, I've been at the course for about 14 years. I'm going on my 15th season, and um, I've really enjoyed it. Okay. This is an old course, old, been around a long time. Can you give a little history to Hyde Park? Absolutely. So we're pretty unique, the fact that we're right in the middle of the city, on the, located on the east side. I think that um, um, when the club was originally founded, it was on the outskirts, just like many urban clubs, but then as Cincinnati grew, um, it kind of grew around Hyde Park. Um, one of the um, unique uh, history facts about Hyde Park was the, the fact that um, originally it was nine holes, and then in 1922, um, the club purchased a parcel of land, which now encompasses the fifth and the sixth holes. And they decided to bring in a, another golf course architect by the name of Donald Ross, and they re redesigned the golf course. And I think it took about three or four years to uh, build the golf course. And there's no historical information to to say that Donald Ross was actually on site, but they think some of his key personnel were here to help out with uh, the new design. Okay. One of the unique features that we've kind of alluded to about this course in Ohio that's rather unique is its, its fairways, which are zoysia japonica, right? Yeah. Can you give us a little background on how it was established, the name of this zoysia? And as such absolutely so the the zoysia grass that we're that we're looking at is is called Meyer zoysia grass and primarily um, this zoysia grass was used because of its cold tolerance so there's not many uh, cultivars there's a few new ones coming out that will have some better cold tolerance um, the club decided in 1980 to to sprig the 14th fairway to trial it because as a challenge back in the 80s there weren't many fungicides to protect um, the annual bluegrass fairways and a lot of grass was lost and during that time there was a, a expansion of zoysia grass in the in the St. Louis area that really uh, caught the attention of some board members so they decided that they would trial the 14th fairway um, once the trial was finished on the 14th fairway um, it really turned out well they were pleased with how fast it established and they felt like that they could uh, make a significant significant difference in playability uh, long term. So it was really cutting edge their thought process of trying to add zoysia grass um, to this area because there weren't any other golf courses that were doing that. Um, once the plan was in place, uh, they decided uh, actually this golf course superintendent that did it or that accomplished this was Tom Brehub. Um, and in 1981, they started to sprig the fairways. It took roughly three years to establish the fairways. And so you can imagine not having carts in the fairways to, was a little bit uh, frustrating, um, but it really turned out well. We call um, the zoysia grass our competitive advantage compared to other courses in the area that are managing bent grass. Okay. Obviously, as the students are looking at this video, they can see how it, that it's dormant, but actually if we look close, it's starting to green up. Uh, when, when does this grass, um, become green in the spring generally and when does it go dormant in the fall that's a great question um, generally uh, we have seen it as early as uh, the middle of March and we've seen dormancy typically we'll see um, in it'll start to go dormant in September um, which is fantastic so we uh, we have the opportunity or there's a great opportunity to save some dollars on mowing fuel labor on the shoulder ends of the season, which is which has turned out really good. Um, I think that from zoysia, from the zoysia grass standpoint, um, sorry, I lost my. That's okay. We <laughs> concrete guys. guys are screaming and stuff. 
<laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> He's, He's calling me. He just yeah, hit so. a train. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so anyway, we were talking about when it goes dormant in the spring, or excuse me, when it greens up in the spring yep. and goes dormant in the fall. So. Yeah, I think um, it, the dormancy, the dormancy piece is more consistent in the. We have a better feel for it in the uh, fall, even when the temperatures are warm, and we've seen some uh, warm falls of late. The the grass uh, really responds to the photo period and the the length of day. So we start; to, it's more consistent compared to the spring when we see those soil temperatures. Um, if they're really, uh, they're, if they're below 70 degrees, the zoysia grass is really uh, doesn't really do much as far as growth. So usually you're looking at soil temperatures above 70 when it starts green. Typically, and that's what we're seeing from a set, and that's also um, a great indicator as far as large patch and some of the issues that we face with large patch. And that kind of gives us an idea when we're going to treat the fairways for uh, that pathogen. Okay, large patch usually coming when the uh, grass comes out of dormancy. That yeah, disease. typically we see that, um, especially in the spring here. Um, and that 70 degree uh, mark in that top inch or so is really a good indicator when we need to apply that uh, uh, fungicide because if we miss that window and large patch sh starts to show up, it, it doesn't uh, disappear very quickly, unfortunately. So I noticed some golfers out here playing and things like that. And uh, um, uh, so when the grass is dormant, it's okay to play on it? Or you have any issues with that? Or you keep people off or you let them play? So uh, that's a great question. One of, the, one of the challenges with managing dormant grass is the fact that it does, the recuperative capacity is very minimal. Um, and any damage that occurs really takes a long time to uh, recover from, especially zoysia grass. It's a lot different than uh, Bermuda grass and it doesn't move laterally very well. And so we try to limit uh, cart traffic as much as possible in the spring and the fall. And uh, typically we'll see, um, we'll get cart traffic out on the fairways when we have the first couple uh, mowings, we're rolling the fairways today just to try to firm them up a little bit to reduce um, the, the uh, indentation from the cart, to, cart traffic. Okay, all right. So once, uh, once the grass is greened up, you mow these fairways at about what height? So we have a, a bench set height of anywhere from about 650 to 700, which is an effective uh, height of cut of 500 with the Baroness mowers that we're using. Okay. So the ball sits up really nice. The, the ball, the ball uh, sits up fan, uh, fantastic. Actually, when I first got here, um, I really didn't let's be honest I really didn't know what I was managing and I treated this fairway as a bent grass fairway so uh, my strategy was to mow it low and um, so as your grass does not like to, or mire does not like to be mowed extremely low and actually we got a lot of negative feedback because a lot of the senior golfers love having the ball teed up and so that we had to adjust that and, and listen to our membership and what we were doing you fertilize these fairways about how much a year? Not much at all. We try not to fertilize. They'll love that answer on a test question. Right? Yeah, not much at all. <laughs> Our target is less than a pound of N per thousand per year. And there are years that we haven't applied any nitrogen. Okay. Um, two reasons. A, nitrogen and water, the combination produces organic matter. And we try to reduce that. Second reason why we do it is we have Bermuda grass encroachment in the fairways. So we do not want to core cultivate these fairways very much at all because we do not want to move Bermuda grass around in the zoysia grass. So we've kind of adapted our fertility regimen to uh, match our traffic pattern. So there's a lot of areas where we'll, um, in front of the greens, we'll increase our uh, fertility just because we have a lot of the mowers turning and so on and so forth cart entry and exit uh, uh, areas as well will increase the fertility but we try to minimize as much as possible how much nitrogen we're putting on the fairway so I would say in an established Myers zoysia grass fairway in at Hyde Park less than a pound of nitrogen is works out really well and we also use growth regulation as a tool too to reduce um, growth and also we 
seem to think that it helps with shade tolerance in some of our areas. And if we can get down to two mowings a week versus three, then we save a lot of labor and we save um, a lot of money in the end. That's why it's a low maintenance. Guys. It is It is extremely low maintenance. Um, well, you mentioned one, any major pest problems? You mentioned large patch, anything else? Yeah, so um, some of the challenges that we face with zoysia grass, probably the, the, the biggest challenge is keeping the equipment sharp. So mowing equipment and trying to keep the equipment sharp is a challenge to say the least. And we're fortunate our equipment manager and the equipment that we're using um, really has worked out extremely well. And we've learned a lot over the years, trial and error. And I've messed up a bunch trying to figure out that combination. Um, biggest pests that we see on Meyer zoysia grass, uh, bill bugs. And we've had bluegrass bill bug out here. And we also believe we have hunting bill bug out here. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, so we've, uh, it's a challenge of managing it. Um, and then large patch is probably the only pathogen that we deal with. So um, once damage occurs on zoysia grass, it is extremely slow to recover, whether it be pests, large patch, uh, mowing damage. Um, that's one of the downsides to having zoysia grass. No weed issues too much? On annual bluegrass is uh, one of our challenges because we have a high population in the rough and the seed bank with a golf course uh, that is over 100 years old, there's a lot of seed in here. So that's another reason why we try to stay away from cultivation is bringing that seed bank up. And uh, so annual bluegrass and managing resistance uh, to herbicides is one of the things that we're concerned with moving forward. We said that if a Canadian can grow zoysia grass, anybody can do it. And I really believe that um, just with the mistakes I made early on in trying to over manage this turf grass because it, if you really do keep it simple and um, you know, pause and look and what you're doing, I think it makes a difference. Where you sprigged and took three years, some of them sod their cores. You know how much that is? I forget. Um, I did a presentation on it. I have to look. Um, it is, um, that's one of the biggest challenges with, I think that's the downside to zoysia grass is the fact that establishment is a challenge. It's very expensive and it takes some time to do it. Especially a golfer, uh, golfers can be impatient and want to have the surface ready to go. And there are some interesting uh, folks, especially in K Kentucky, that are doing strip sodding, so having a space in between, and they're managing both cool season and uh, Meyer zoysia grass, and having a little more transition, allowing uh, allowing the zoysia to outcompete because of fungicide or reducing fungicides. And Dollar Spot is is removing the ryegrass or mo removing the Kentucky bluegrass, and then the zoysia grass. You start to see it starts to move, um, but cost per acre. It is, it's very expensive to do. Our sods to source, um, we, we have to go almost to Arkansas to get our sod. So you can imagine the challenges in some of the, um, from a freight standpoint, and then also from the standpoint of bringing unique weeds and pests further north. And I think that in the future, especially with what we're seeing in new pests already and the climate shifting a little bit um, it'll be interesting what we're introducing further north 